Hi everyone, this is Dr. Anna and I'm here to talk to you about our second module, which is Blytectonics. It's pretty amazing, so I hope you're going to enjoy it. Uh, the next slide is just showing you a movie which is made by uh, this Incorporated Research Institution for Seismology, so it's IRIS. Uh, and they are supported by NSF and they made these amazing videos about plate tectonics. So I'm going to show you a couple of them. So right here. Much of our knowledge of Earth's insides comes from monitoring the thousands of earthquakes that occur every year. Five centuries ago, the world had mostly accepted that the Earth was not only a sphere, but was thought to be of uniform rock throughout. 200 years later, Sir Isaac Newton, studying our planetary system, calculated that the interior of the Earth must be made of far denser material than the surface rock. Newton's estimate of the overall density of the Earth remains essentially unchanged today. In the early 1900s, scientists discovered they could use data from earthquakes as a method for looking deep beneath the surface. By understanding the travel times of different seismic waves to worldwide stations, scientists were able to calculate where boundaries occurred and what those boundaries represented. They thus determined that the Earth has three layers based on chemical composition, crust, mantle, and core. As an analogy for relative scale, these layers can be compared to an egg, with the shell representing the outermost brittle layer, the white the mantle, and the yolk the core. How did scientists figure out where these layers were? They used the arrival times of seismic waves to worldwide seismic stations. Seismic waves leave the hypocenter of an earthquake and travel in all directions. If the Earth had no change with depth, seismic waves would travel straight paths, but the Earth has composition density and temperature changes that cause the seismic rays to reflect and refract along boundaries as velocity in the mantle generally increases with depth. Innovations in computer technology in concert with a steady beat of earthquakes help scientists to continue to refine our understanding of Earth's interior. The basic layers of the Earth are grouped by their chemical composition. The crust is made of chiefly eight major elements, shown here by their relative abundance. Oxygen, silicon, aluminum, iron, calcium, sodium, potassium, and magnesium. At this scale, the crust is too thin to show as more than a thin line without zooming in. The crust ranges from 5 to 10 kilometers thick in the dense basaltic oceanic crust, and up to 75 kilometers in the thicker, less dense granitic rock of the continental crust. This difference in density and thickness of these two types of crust is the reason why the Earth has oceans and continents. The crust is often mistaken for the tectonic plates. However, the crust is just the top part of the tectonic plates. We'll return to the topic in a moment, but first back to the three layers. Below the crust is the mantle, composed of the same elements, but a different proportion, with increasing amounts of the heavier elements in the rock. The chemical composition of the 2,900 kilometer thick mantle varies little from top to bottom, but there are distinct physical variations due to temperature and pressure differences. The uppermost mantle is relatively cool and brittle and ranges from 50 to 120 kilometers thick. Below this zone, the upper mantle becomes notably more plastic and malleable due to the right combination of heat and pressure. That ductal zone is known as the asthenosphere and varies up to 400 kilometers deep, depending mainly on temperature. The lower mantle comprises 55% of the planet by volume and is denser and hotter than the upper mantle. At the center of the Earth is the core, which is nearly twice as dense as the mantle because it's a metallic iron alloy rather than rock. Unlike the egg yolk analogy, Earth's core is made up of two distinct parts, the liquid outer core and a solid inner core. Although the inner core is hotter than the outer core, there's also greater pressure squeezing the atoms, changing the material from liquid to solid. The liquid outer core is convecting vigorously and generates Earth's magnetic field. But back to plate tectonics. As you recall, the cool uppermost part of the mantle is brittle. 
How can the top of the mantle be brittle when the same material in the asthenosphere is ductile? A big hug candy bar can be used as an analogy. Like the uppermost cool mantle, when the big hunk is cold, it is brittle and breaks when bent. When you heat it up, it becomes ductile or plastic and can bend and flow. Earlier, we mentioned that the crust is merely the top of the tectonic plate. This uppermost brittle mantle behaves much like the overlying crust and together they form a rigid layer of rock called the lithosphere that moves in unison. The lithosphere ranges from as much as 100 kilometers thick in the oceanic plate to 200 kilometers thick in the continental plates. It is in this brittle zone that earthquakes occur due to compression, extension, and shearing. Over billions of years, the cooled surface of the earth has been broken up into the moving plates that are called lithospheric plates, or more commonly, tectonic plates. Because they are mostly more buoyant than the asthenosphere, they float above it. Convection currents, driven by temperature, pressure, and gravity, provide the mechanism for the process we know as plate tectonics. Earthquakes, volcanoes, and the Earth's magnetic field are all the consequence of the Earth trying to lose heat as it converts some of the thermal energy into mechanical energy in the process. Without the tremendous heat being released from the interior of the Earth, we would not have had the mechanism to drive plate tectonics. And without earthquakes, we may not have had a way to see so deep into the Earth. As you could see, this movie was really helpful to transfer us from what we learned in the last module, the layers of the earth or the zones of the earth so this was a good summary of that and now it is transforming us into plate tectonics really well so plate tectonics you know plate tectonics when i started to go to school like i should say uh high school and i went to a special geology high school in hungary uh they didn't know about plate tectonics, or I, I should say that the model completely didn't get together yet. That, of course, it started earlier, but when I learned how the earth and the orogenies and the mountains are forming, it wasn't well developed yet. So it's a revolutionary paradigm in geology, and it's very young. It's really probably 50 years old or so that it's now really at the play where it really explains everything. It tells us where to find geological resources, completely understand now why do we have volcanoes, earthquakes, where do they happen, what kind of volcanoes, how big earthquakes, does it make tsunami or it doesn't make tsunami. It just explains everything about Earth basically. It's simply the most important module in this class and I will relate everything to plate tectonics later. Okay, so this is just a very short video from the same uh, people about the history. How did the plate tectonics happen? And I mean, how did they realize that this is how it happens? And what kind of indirect and direct evidence do we have that that's what uh, makes Earth so dynamic inside? Plate tectonic theory was not accepted for centuries because no one could adequately answer the question, what is the mechanism that drives the plates? In the late 16th century, Abraham Ortelius, in compiling New World Explorer maps, noted that by carefully considering the coastlines of the Atlantic Ocean, it appeared that the Americas had been torn away from Europe and Africa by, he theorized, earthquakes and floods. Over the next three centuries, other proponents of an original single continent included Francois Paget, who invoked the sinking of the land between the continents to create the Atlantic Ocean, George Louis Leclerc, who resurrected Ortelius's theory of a great earthquake and floods pushing the land apart, and finally Antonio Snyder Pellegrini, who proposed that the shape of the continents, supported by fossil evidence, argued for the origin of a single continent, which not only joined the continents across the Atlantic Ocean, but also included Australia. No one, however, could explain how the continents moved. Bathymetric surveys in the following decades unveiled an extensive submarine mountain ridge between the continents that ran the <laughs> Meanwhile, seismic data began to reveal Earth's layers, a core, a crust mantle boundary, and a thick outer layer called the lithosphere that lay above a less dense asthenosphere. 
In 1912, German meteorologist Alfred Wagner, also intrigued by the fit of the edges of the continents, championed the concept of continental drift, based on his study of similar rock types, geological structures, and fossils on both sides of the Atlantic. To make it work, he hypothesized that the mechanisms causing the drift might be the centrifugal force of the Earth's rotation or the change in its axis of rotation. Wagner also speculated that, quote, the mid-Atlantic ridge is continuously tearing open and making space for fresh, relatively fluid and hot material from depth, end quote. His views were considered preposterous and improbable and were rejected by most Earth scientists. Following the discovery of radioactivity in 1896, it became clear that Earth's interior was heated by radioactive decay and that the insides would be largely molten. Indeed, by 1926, a liquid core was determined. In 1927, geologist Arthur Holmes, studying radioactive decay, proclaimed that mantle convection was the answer to Wagner's missing power source to drive continental drift. He based it on the fact that as a substance is heated, its density decreases and it rises to the surface until it cools when it sinks again. But convection of the solid mantle alone was still unpalatable to most geoscientists. Nuclear bomb testing in the 1950s motivated the establishment of the worldwide standardized seismograph network to monitor explosions, prompting a greater concentration of seismograph stations. The increased data allowed seismologists to precisely locate far more earthquakes, revealing that most occur in discrete areas, near trenches and along mid-ocean ridges. Decades after Wagner's death, geologist Marie Tharp, left in the lab to examine data from ocean floor field surveys, theorized that mid-ocean ridges appeared to be extensional rift valleys formed by plate motion, thus paving the way for the acceptance of Wagner's continental drift theory. Her colleague, Bruce Heason, initially skeptical, published her work in 1956 under his name, but ascribed the extension to an expanding Earth theory. It wouldn't be until the mid-60s that he would accept Tharp's interpretation of plate motion. Curiously, it was Harry Hess who, in 1962, was credited for recognizing that oceans did grow from spreading ridges. He also defined ocean trenches as locations where ocean floor was destroyed and recycled. But he, too, lacked geophysical evidence to confirm this theory. Just one year later, this concept was supported by ocean floor magnetic surveys that revealed symmetrical patterns of magnetic striping on either side of the mid-ocean ridges. These stripes were found to be the same age at similar distances away from the ridge on each side. While pondering the mystery of how volcanoes, such as the Hawaiian island chain, could be so far from spreading ridges or subduction zones, Tuzo Wilson proposed the plates moved over hotspots. Following this breakthrough, with the discovery that ocean ridges were connected with transform faults, the science rapidly blossomed with the definition of the three main plate boundary types. Divergent margins, where plates move apart, convergent margins, where plates push together at subduction zones or mountain ranges, and transform margins, where plates move horizontally past each other. As geophysical evidence supporting plate tectonics accumulated during the 1960s, scientists revived Holmes' theory of mantle convection as a driving force for moving the plates. Mantle convection assuredly plays a role, but it doesn't explain how some plates creep along faster than the convection currents beneath them. This led scientists to a fundamental force, gravity. Gravity acts on the tectonic plates, resulting in what are now referred to as ridge push at the spreading ridges and slab pull beneath subduction zones. This is an evolving science that not only involves these three forces, but involves friction and much more, leaving scientists to ponder, what will be the next tool that helps reveal new facets of plate tectonics? So I'm going to continue from here in the next segment.